13% of all women will develop breast cancer in her lifetime. That's one in eight. Men can get it too, but their chance is closer to one in 800, which is 1% of all breast cancers in the United States. Can you lower your risk for breast cancer? Stay tuned to find out. You're listening to Healthy Looks Great on You, a lifestyle medicine podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Vicki Petz Casper. For two decades, I practiced as a board certified obstetrician gynecologist, navigating the complex world of women's health. But life took an unexpected turn when my own health failed. Emerging on the other side, I discovered the transformative power of lifestyle medicine. Now, I'm on a mission to share its incredible benefits with you. So buckle up, because we are going on a journey to our very own mini medical school, where you will learn how lifestyle medicine can help prevent, treat, and sometimes even reverse disease. This is episode 119. Six Ways to Lower Your Risk for Breast Cancer The American Cancer Society predicts that there will be over 300,000 new cases of breast cancer this year and 42,000 deaths. So I'm guessing you know someone who has had breast cancer or even you yourself. So how about some good news before we get started? The survival rate in this country is now 89%. Wow. Breast cancer is the most frequently diagnosed malignancy in the entire world, and it's the leading cause of cancer death in women globally. In the United States, it's the number two cause of cancer death, second to lung cancer, and accounts for approximately 30% of all new cancer cases in women. FYI, skin cancer is actually the most frequently diagnosed cancer. But remember... Heart disease is the leading cause of death in both men and women. Now, being female increases the risk of breast cancer by 100-fold. It does occur in men, but it's much more rare. So, what kind of women get breast cancer? Want to guess the biggest risk factor? Are you sure that's right? Your biggest risk factor for getting breast cancer is getting older. I mean, getting older is a good thing, right? It's actually pretty uncommon for women under the age of 45 to get breast cancer. Oh yes, of course it happens. But 7 in 8 breast cancers are in women over the age of 45. And the average age at diagnosis is 62. So about half of those occur before and half of those cases occur after. While we're talking about halves... 50% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer have known risk factors. Plus, there's about 10% that have either a family history or even a cancer gene. Now think about it. Does that number surprise you? I think there's a misconception that a negative family history means you're not at risk. Not true at all. 85% of all women who are diagnosed with breast cancer have no family history. Now, about 2% of all breast cancers do occur in women under the age of 45, and another 2.5% occur in that 50 to 59 age range. Then it's 7% in women ages 60 to 69, and another 7% in women ages 70 and older. So, what are those other risk factors besides age? Hmm, I'm so glad you asked. In general terms, the risk are related to influences of a woman's reproductive factors, proliferative breast disease, demographics, environmental exposures, and in addition to hereditary factors, drum roll please, lifestyle. Before I dive into specifics though, we need to go to mini medical school. I mentioned several words that need explanations and definitions. First of all, We all know cancer is bad and scary, but what is it actually? Cancer is a disease where cells in the body just grow out of control, like they're normal cells and then they transform and take over 
either locally and replace normal cells and their normal function, but they can also spread to distant organs and do damage there. The other word we should define is proliferative breast disease. I mentioned that as a risk factor for breast cancer. And this is like a big bucket of changes in the breast tissue, and it includes dense breast tissue as well as atypia. Atypia is where the cells look abnormal, but they're not cancer. So sometimes when you get a mammogram report, you may see that word dense on there. Now, dense in the breast isn't the same as dense in the head, and aren't you glad? But this term refers to the amount of glandular and connective breast tissue as it relates to the amount of fat in the breast. Breasts with a relatively large amount of fat are easy to see through when you try to image them, as opposed to women who have little fat in the breast. It's just so much more dense. It's like looking through a lead shield, and it's hard to image. Now, fortunately, there have been incredible advances in technology with 3D mammography. And it's really the gold standard now, especially in women with dense breasts, because they do have a higher incidence of breast cancer, and it's harder to detect. There are several things that determine how dense the breasts are, but it's mostly in your genes. No, not your blue genes, your hereditary genes that you get from your parents. But this can also be influenced by physical fitness and a low-fat, high-carb diet. And I have some really great news. It's not influenced by caffeine intake. Woohoo! And pour me another cup. Women who take hormones after menopause also have denser breasts, and women who take anti hormones like tamoxifen, which are used to prevent and treat breast cancer, lower the density. And here's something interesting women with a higher bone mineral density have an increased risk of breast cancer. Hmm. Think about it. Estrogen makes your bones stronger and your breast denser. And it's complicated, but estrogen is associated with the risk of breast cancer. Now, I'm not just talking about the estrogen you take after menopause. I'm talking about what your body makes too. And things like how old you are and when you have your first period and how old you are when you make the transition to your last period, all of that affects your risk. We call it the estrogen window. And the longer the estrogen window is open, the higher the risk. So if you started your period early and went through menopause late, that's a long estrogen window and it increases the risk. Now, when you hear the word reproductive, that probably makes you think about pregnancy. And women who have never had a baby have an increased risk of breast cancer. Age matters too. If a woman has her first child later in life, that also increases the risk. There are a lot more nuances in this equation, but that's kind of the simple version. And even though I made a point to tell you that most women who get breast cancer don't have a family history, family history is still super important. Because if you do have a first degree relative, that's a mother, a sister, or a daughter with breast cancer, that doubles your risk. Now, let's stop right here and clear something up. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's an identifiable gene that can be tested for. You may have heard of BRCA1 and BRCA2. Those are known genetic mutations that increase the risk of breast and other cancers. Now, it's time for a pop quiz. How many breast cancers do you think are associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2, the breast cancer genes? The answer is 5 to 10 percent. I bet that's lower than you thought. Now before we get to the six things that can lower your risk of breast cancer, let's look at the risk factors that are beyond your control. First, this is really weird, but being tall. Women who are taller tend to have an increased risk. Hmm, Nobody knows exactly why, but it's interesting. And next, let's mention race and ethnicity. This is huge and you need to listen closely. In the United States, the highest risk is among white women. But get this, many of the racial differences in breast cancer rates are attributable to, here's a hint, drum roll again, lifestyle. And I also want to mention that the death rate is much higher in Hispanic and Latino women, and African American women also have a poorer prognosis. 
This disparity is related to presenting with more aggressive breast cancers or presenting at a later stage, and it highlights the needs to address disparity in care. All right, let's move on to those six things. Number one, breastfeed. What? Oh, you said it's too late? Yeah, most of us are past that. But I wanted to give you the information. There is a protective effect from breastfeeding. And the longer you are able to breastfeed, the more protection you get. And this is probably because ovulation is generally suppressed while you're breastfeeding. Number two, limit alcohol intake. Actually, abstaining altogether is even better. The more you drink, the higher your risk for breast cancer. And women should have no more than one drink a day, which is 12 ounces of beer, 5 ounces of wine, or 1.5 ounces of hard liquor. And even moderate drinking significantly ups the risk. Number three is don't smoke for so many reasons. But smokers have an increased risk of lots of things like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, many kind of cancers, including breast cancer. And even exposure to secondhand smoke is a risk factor. Number four is limit hormone use after menopause. Now, here's where it gets really complicated. And I get asked all the time, should I take hormones? And if this is a topic you are interested in, you might want to sign up for Menopause Answers. You'll get a short two-minute video answer to your questions about menopause and hormones. I'll put a link in the show notes. But the bottom line is, am I against hormone therapy? Nope. I'm simply telling you that with any medication, there are risks and there are benefits, and that's why you need an in-depth discussion with your doctor. You have to look at your own medical history as well as your family history and your risk factors for breast cancer, but also things like heart disease before you can decide. But the topic of the day is reducing the risk of breast cancer, and studies show that combination hormone therapy, that's therapy with estrogen and progesterone, may slightly increase the risk. Now, side note, if you've had a hysterectomy, you can take estrogen and you don't have to take progesterone. And in the big studies, estrogen alone did not increase the risk of breast cancer. So bottom, bottom line is, if you need them and don't have a strong reason not to use them, then just use a low dose and keep evaluating each year whether or not you should continue it as you get older. There is no evidence that, quote, bioidentical hormones are any better. And while we're muddying the waters, let me mention that the risk of breast cancer is slightly and temporarily increased while using hormonal contraception. But remember, most breast cancers occur long after the need for birth control. And the risk is very small, and it stops when you stop using hormonal birth control. Is that clear? Well, there's always the rewind button. Number five is get active. Now, let's sit down with this one for a minute. And yeah, I meant for that to be a pun. The incidence of breast cancer is lower in women who are physically active when compared to sedentary women. And this goes for both premenopausal women as well as postmenopausal women. Now, part of it's related to weight. But that doesn't seem to be the whole reason. There also appears to be a hormonal influence by exercise. Levels of estrogen in the bloodstream as well as insulin and insulin growth factor 1 levels are reduced by moving more and sitting less. The goal should be a minimum of 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise. And when I say moderate, remember I mean you can still talk but you can't sing while you're exercising. I mean, I can't really sing even sitting at rest, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is if you're walking the block with your friends and y'all are just chatting it up and you could sing the national anthem without missing a beat, then you probably need to pick up the pace. You need to get your heart pumping. Also, do strength training at least a couple of times a week. Now, before we move on to the last thing you can do to reduce your risk of developing breast cancer, I want to explore the relationship between weight and breast cancer. It's a bit confusing. So let's start with the simple stuff. If you are obese, that increases your risk of breast cancer during the postmenopausal years. And if you lose weight, 
you reduce your risk. And when I said simple, I meant simple to understand, not simple to do. But here's what's paradoxical. Premenopausal women with a higher BMI actually have a lower risk of breast cancer. You heard that right. Now, refer back to the very beginning of this podcast and review the numbers as they relate to age. And you'll remember that most breast cancers occur in the postmenopausal years. Besides, obesity literally increases your risk of just about everything, including all cause mortality, which means dying from anything. And if you're wondering why, adipose tissue makes estrogen. It's also associated with higher insulin levels, and that's probably a factor too. So number six is maintain a healthy weight. But specifically, I could have separated this one out and made it stand alone as number seven. Eat a low-fat diet. Reducing fat intake reduces deaths from breast cancer. Again, it's probably related to peripheral conversion of estrogen in adipose tissue as well as insulin levels. And of course, reducing fat intake helps maintain a healthy weight. So instead of eating high fat foods, eat a diet of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. All that fiber helps you stay full, and that is the key to weight loss. Maybe a lower chance of breast cancer is just another motivator. Our good friend fiber reduced breast cancer by 12% in one study. And it suggested that increasing your daily intake by 10 grams a day drops your risk by 4%. Of course, more research is needed, but wow. Hopefully right now, you're asking yourself, how can I add 10 grams of fiber to my diet? Well, if you want to do it all in one fell swoop, oats. In one cup, you'll get a whopping 16 grams. A cup of lentils is another great way to get all 10 grams at once. Beans and peas will also get you up there with about 10 grams of fiber. But get this, almonds are 13 grams, but popcorn is 14 grams. Wow. Or you could try a cup of raspberries or a cup of avocado and get nearly 7 grams. Things like broccoli, carrots, apples, and bananas all give you nearly three grams. Blueberries or a single artichoke will bump you up by five grams. So okie dokie artichoke, now we know how to eat more fiber. Let's try and digest the facts. You can slice and dice the data as many ways as a 4D mammogram, but there is some evidence that a Mediterranean diet decreases the risk. And of course, it's so good for your heart and lowers the risk of stroke, high blood pressure, and possibly dementia. And it makes sense. Replace your bad fats like bacon, butter, and cheese with good fats from nuts and seeds and extra virgin olive oil. While you're at it, you'll lower your risk for type 2 diabetes. Now, there is some evidence that soy and phytoestrogens, which remember are compounds naturally found in plants that resemble the 17 beta estradiol that our bodies make, may lower the risk of breast cancer. And these are found in soybeans and other legumes, as well as fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Let me just keep saying fruits, vegetables, and whole grains because they're so good for you. Processed meat and red meat consumption is slightly linked to premenopausal breast cancer in some studies. Some people think it's the iron content. Others blame the hormones that are given to cattle. Who knows, but we do know that filling up on fruits, vegetables, and whole grains is always a good idea. Remember, there is no fiber in animal products. Breast cancer is so common. I know you or someone you love has been affected. Some people have lots of risk factors, and others with zero risk factors get it anyway. But do what you can to lower your risk. I've touched on a lot of different topics that have been discussed on previous podcast episodes, so I'm going to put a link in the show notes to all episodes, but also there's a mini course you can sign up for that helps you get started. Either way, 
There are lots of links about how to cut back on your drinking or how to stop smoking or how to start eating better or exercising more. So you'll want to check out those resources in the show notes. Here's the deal. Don't drink, don't smoke. And as my mom would say, don't chew and don't run with the boys who do. And if you're starting a family, breastfeed if you can. And make thoughtful decisions about hormone therapy. Move more and maintain a healthy weight by limiting your unhealthy fat intake. Eat fruits, vegetables, and whole grains because it's always good for your health. And healthy looks great on you. The information contained in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered to be a substitute for medical advice. You should continue to follow up with your physician or healthcare provider and take medication as prescribed. Though the information in this podcast is evidence-based, new research may develop and recommendations may change.